This afternoon's session, we have three more sessions ahead of us before we continue with the parallel session one and two. The upcoming session, titled Silver, Liquid and Illiquid, the Modified Open Mint and Gold and Silver, will be mod uh, and Gold and Silver as Parallel Monetary Systems, will be moderated by Associate Professor Dr. Kevin Cox from the University of Canberra. Dr. Kevin Cox is an Associate Professor at the University of Canberra. He is the Founder and Executive Director of Identity Private Limited. He was trained as a civil engineer and scientist and worked as an information systems designer and teacher of information systems in Australia, Indonesia, United States and Hong Kong. He has a PhD in information systems from the University of Canberra, a Master of Science in Computing from the Australian National University and Bachelor degree in Civil Engineering and Mathematics from the Tasmania University. Dr. Kevin Cox, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I wish to thank the organisers very much for this, what I consider to be a great privilege of introducing Hugo Salinas. Um, I, I hadn't, must confess that I hadn't heard of his work until just recently, but I've been going out on the internet and exploring it, and I find his ideas quite interesting and I think that they will actually work. I think that what he's proposing has a good chance of making a difference in this whole monetary area. Uh, Hugo Salinas Price is the creator of Mexico's Electra retail chain. Electra was founded in 1950 by Salinas Price's father as a company manufacturing radios. <coughs> Salinas Price joined the company as general manager in 1952 and in 1953, the company began to manufacture television sets. It was decided to sell these sets directly to the consumer through instalment sales. This relationship with the consumer led to the creation of the Electra retail chain, which offers general durable consumer goods to the public. The current head of Electra is his son, Ricardo Salinas Pliego. Uh, Hugo Salinas Price currently is retired from retailing and focuses on being a proponent of a monetized silver coin to circulate in parallel with paper money in Mexico. Salinas Price is president, Mexican Civil Association Pro Silver, AC. His website is www.plata.com.mx. Salinas, a Mexican citizen, was born in his mother's hometown, Brian Ath Bryn? Bryn? Bryn Athen, Bryn Athen uh, Pennsylvania, USA, on March the 11th, 1932. He holds no university degrees, he has lived all his life in Mexico, and he is author of several books dealing with silver money and with the general monetary disorder in the world. He and his wife of 58 years have three children, and 18, 18 grandchildren. I'd like to, first of all, thanks, give my thanks to Professor Dr. Ahmed Kamil, the convener, organizer of this conference, and to Mr. Shirazdin Adam Shah, the chairman of the organizing committee, for having thought of inviting me. And also, I must express my appreciation and thanks to Sheikh Imran Hossein, because I think it was his recommendation that uh, led uh, Mr. Shirazdin to, to invite me to address you. I'm very pleased to be here, and, and I'm admiring this, this country that is exhibiting such uh, vitality. I can sense the, the vitality in this country. 
and, and I see you, the Malaysians have done an excellent job here of development. Uh, I congratulate you. And I also, also I was amazed to listen to ex-Prime Minister Mahathir Mohammed's address. One of the very, he's a unique politician in the sense that he's, been, he's telling us the truth. And that is a, some, a very rare thing. It was, it was uh, uh, Dr. Mahathir's attempt to, to introduce gold and silver into circulation in this country. Uh, that, that a news that reached me uh, in Mexico only in a fragmentary way. I didn't know exactly what he was trying to do, so I can't and I still don't know exactly what he was trying to do, but the news reached me that he was trying to introduce gold and silver into circulation in Malaysia. And this is exactly the theme of the things that I have been thinking about and, and uh, writing about uh, since 1997, more or less, the last 15 years. And I tried to contact Dr. Mahathir, and I even went to the, to the Mal Malaysian ambassador and, and gave him a, a, a package of, of uh, writings and articles to forward to Dr. Mahathir, but I never heard from him. This is undoubtedly a, a person of his standing receives such piles of mail from all over that he can't, he can't attend to everything. So, it was a real pleasure to be able to see Dr. Mahathir, if I was not able to speak with him, but at least to see him, to shake his hand, and to listen to his words of wisdom. And I have given to him this little uh, booklet, which I, I have brought from Mexico, uh, 1,000 copies, and uh, for you, so each one of you uh, can can have one when I'm through in 45 minutes because I don't want you reading while I'm speaking. So, <laughs> so but uh, here are some some thoughts that I have put in this in this uh, in this uh, pamphlet, and it's also accompanied with a little diskette so that you can put this all on your computer and forward it around and comment it if you want. And here are several chapters. The silver dirham in circulation in Malaysia. Two, how to insert the dirham into a fiat monetary system. Ah, that's the, the, that's the crooks. Method to calculate the monetary value of the dirham. The silver dirham and the banking system. The supply of silver. Reasons for introducing the silver dirham. The failure, this is a, uh, just an annex, sort of philosophical annex, which it means, which is the title is the failure of mechanistic economics, and so that's the contents of this little booklet. So, to begin with, let's say let's let's go back to 1940. Now, I, I was born in 1932, but uh, I was born in 32. Now, I, don't, I, I know nothing about how, what Malaysia was like in 1940, except perhaps the Japanese were already here. I don't know if they were here or not, but not, they weren't here, they were on their way. Uh, but I, would be, I wouldn't be surprised if there weren't silver circulating in Malaysia in 1940. It would not surprise me at all. As a matter of fact, you know, the Mexican silver came to the Far East uh, to, through uh, a ship which used to sail uh, from Acapulco, Mexico, across the Pacific, touching Guam and going on to Manila and unloading its, its cargo of tens of thousands of pieces of eight, which made their way afterwards into China and all parts of Southeast Asia. 
And that, that, that trade went on for, for some 200 years until we had, uh, until in the independence came, well, independence in a sense, because we became less, we became independent of one power, but we became dependent on another power. So that was our independence and a relative term. Anyway, the whole world in 1940, silver was in use the whole all over the world as as a, as a small as a, a currency uh, for for small denominations and and at that time we we had in Mexico when I was growing up this was a, a peso this is a one peso coin which circulated in 19 from 1920 to 1945 and you know during this time the price of silver went up and down now this coin never had a full one peso worth of silver in it when it was first coined it had only about 48 cents centavos of of silver in pesos of in unless in other words 48 percent of the value of the coin was in silver, and the rest was sovereign uh, seniorage for the central bank. And the, the price of silver went down to as far as about 32 centavos in the depths of the depression, and that never affected the use of the coin. Nobody ever returned this coin to the, to the uh, treasury for redemption because uh, nobody thought it was necessary. It was immaterial to people that the price of silver had gone down. And many people saved these because afterwards, the, when the price of silver rose, this coin went out of circulation. And truckloads, truckloads and truckloads and truckloads of these coins were sent off to be melted down because the, the bullion silver was worth more than the coins because they had a stamped value which says one peso on them. In the course of of those 25 years, there were 468 million of these coins were minted and put into the hands of the people. Now you have a similar case with this half dollar coin, uh, which was minted in 1951. And this coin never had 50 cents worth of silver in it. And silver even went down in value from 1951, I think it even went down somewhat before rising. And again, the same thing happened as to the peso. By 1965, the value of the silver in this coin, this half United States half dollar, the value of the silver in this coin was worth more than 50 cents. And so also large numbers of these coins were melted down. I mention all of this because this is part of the how it forms part of the system for reintroducing silver into circulation in this country. It can be done by taking the value of silver, whatever the size of the coin. I'm proposing a three gram coin, but it can be 2.9 grams or it can be 3.9 two or whatever you want, or you can have a larger coin. This is the, the system is what is important. You take, the, you take the value of the silver in ringgits. You add the cost of minting in ringgits, add the two together. Give it, multiply by a, a number which will give the central bank or the treasury a seniorage. I propose 10%. So you multiply by 1.1. Again, this is optional. You can have 1.5. You, you, can, you can double the value, the, the, the value of the silver in turning the, thing in, the, the coin into money. But I propose 10%. Then when you have multiplied the cost of the silver plus the cost of minting by 1.1, you 
round out the figure to a round number which the people can remember. And that is the way that, the, that silver can be monetized and put into circulation. Why is it necessary to do this? Because it used to be in the, 18th, in the 19th century that what was important for uh, the use of a coin as money was important to know the weight of silver. And to this date, we have Mexican coins, pieces of eight that came into, for instance, Hong Kong or some other place of China and were stamped by local merchants because they, they, wanted, they wanted a local stamp that would assure the receiver that that coin had been tested and proved to have the weight it's it supposed to have. So silver was worth, well, it had a monetary value according to weight, but that is no longer the case. Everybody has forgotten how to calculate prices in terms of weight of silver. We, don't, we can't think of that. I mean, we're going to go to the gas station and we're going to, to pay with a weight of silver, well, the cashier is not going to accept it. I mean, because because how can how can he know what the what the weight is? And it's impossible. We don't think in terms of weight anymore. This was the way it, things were done before. But humanity has forgotten how to calculate value in terms of weight of silver. Besides, the value of silver is fluctuating. So. We, we, don't, we don't know how to use it if the value is fluctuating. We can save silver as a protection again for the future, but that is also speculation. I think it's a good speculation, but many people are afraid of speculating, especially poorer people. The, the poorer people don't want to run the risk of having their savings go down, not even a little bit. It's cost them too much trouble to have a little bit of savings. So the speculation can increase as people have more money and can run the risk of a, of a fall in the value. And, and so we find that people that already have money in a certain amount are the ones that are willing to buy the silver while it's still a commodity. The silver as a commodity changes into money when you follow the process that I am uh, outlining. One, you take the silver. Two, you give it a monetary value that is higher than the value of the silver in the coin. Two, three, if the price of silver rises, then you raise the monetary value so that you restore the profit of the treasury in minting. It continues to be profitable. The coin is not going to be melted down because it's worth more as money than as silver, okay? And four, critical to this is that when the price of silver falls, the coin retains its value. Just as this coin, a one peso coin, retained its value when the price of silver fell. And just as this coin has retained its value 50 cents until 1965 in the face of falls in the price of silver. What, did, what destroyed these coins, what made them disappear, was rises in the price of silver, which could not be matched by increases in the, in the value. That is why I am recommending a quoted monetary value, not a stamped value. You take, a, you take the silver, put it into a coin and attribute a monetary value, but not a stamped value, so that you can raise the price, raise the monetary value of the coin when the price of silver increases. We had an experience in Mexico I will tell you about. Do I still have time? We, we had an experience in 1945, this coin went out of circulation. I remember as a boy, uh, it was substituted with paper notes. Oh, you know, I was so fascinated to have paper notes because I was 12 years old or 13 years old. 
And to have a folding money to put in my pocket, that was just wonderful. And for one peso, I didn't know where the thing was going, of course, what was going to happen. But it was so wonderful to have those nice, freshly printed one peso notes. And soon, you couldn't get a single one of these. They all disappeared. Because when the peso notes came out, people held, saved these, these pesos. And, and that's what always happens. And uh, what happened then was that instead of the central bank, we have a central bank in Mexico like you have here. Instead of, instead of, uh, instead of being able to raise the, the monetary value of this coin, which they couldn't do because it says one peso, well, they had to go out of the circulation. And they minted a new coin with less silver. So you see, the central bank recognized the increase in the value of silver by reducing the amount of silver in the coin. Now, what I'm proposing is keep the value, keep the silver in the coin and make it circulate permanently so you don't have to ever send this. No one will ever have the temptation to send the coin to the refinery for melting down. But that can only be done if you can alter the, the quoted monetary value. I hope I, that has been made clear. And this, this uh, process of reducing the amount of silver in the coin went on for several years. Now, the original pieces of eight, which were minted in Mexico by the Spaniards for the king of Spain contained about 24 grams of silver. And by the way, the Mexican pieces of eight, minted for the king of Spain, of course, were the, was the coin that was used as a model for the US silver dollar. If you look it up, you will see that the definition of the US dollar is about 24 grams, because Thomas Jefferson uh, had several different pieces of eight examined, and he found that the average weight of silver in them was 24 grams, and that became the US dollar, with different features, but the same amount of silver as the, as the Spanish uh, coin, which was the, the world's dollar at the time was the Spanish uh, silver pieces of eight minted in Mexico. Well, anyway, when my father was born in 1907, those were still, the coin was no longer, had the, the, the symbols of the King of Spain, they all had the symbols of Mexico. And it was no longer called a piece of eight, it was called a peso. A peso means, peso means weight, because you see the coin had the same weight, so they called it the peso, because it had the weight of the original coin of the King of Spain. And the, in 1907, when my father was born, the doctor was paid with the same money that was in use in Mexico since 1535. So a remarkable, a remarkable period of stability because we were ruled by a king. And I am in favor of kings, if they are good kings. Sometimes, well, uh, also, rather tepid applause. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I don't believe too much in a democratic system. Uh, <laughs> okay. But don't accuse me of being a fascist. No, no, no. Don't accuse me of that. No. I've even forgotten what I was going to say. <laughs> well, yes, when my father was born... We had the same amount, the same, uh, the same money that was in circulation, basically since 1535. Then we had a revolution. This, then, from 24 grams, when the revolution was practically over in 1920, we had we got this coin with only 12 grams. You see the tendency from 24 to 12. Then this one went out of circulation. And another one came in with seven grams, smaller peso. 
Then that one went out of circulation because the price of silver continued rising because of inflation, paper money printing. We got into paper money printing and, and like the rest of the world, we took a little time to get there, but we finally caught up. And the next time we got another coin with only four, four grams of silver. And then we went to another coin that only had 1.6 grams of silver. It was mainly base metal. And that was the last attempt to have a coin of one peso uh, of silver. And so that was the way that we lost. We lost, after several attempts to retain silver, we lost silver in circulation. But we can get it back, and I think we could get it back in permanent form, just like you could. And that's why I've been proposing, well, I, I propose in this, in this little uh, uh, pamphlet, a monetization of a small coin. I, I take three grams as a kind of dirham. Perhaps technically the, the dirham would be 2.97 grams or something like that, but I, I didn't have the information, so I, we have some, some authority mentions three grams, so I, we took three grams. And you will see here the, the way do I have a, do I have a, 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 can we see the, where is it? No, 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 wait. More, more, more. I want the graph. That one, that one. Well, this graph is a little complicated for you to understand, but you will, if you, if you look at it uh, with care here, it shows you that you establish an initial value, that's the top line, and if the price of silver in ringgits does not change, it continues. If the price of silver goes up, it increases the monetary value. If the price of silver then falls, it retains the last value. That's the essence of this graph. Also, I should mention that in the legislation that we've presented in Mexico, we have a provision that in the case there is a speculative bubble in the price of silver, the central bank should exercise discretion and refrain from following the boom upward. And I think, I don't have mentioned this before, but I'll mention it now, that there is such a thing as a 200-day moving average. And I think that if the price of silver were to exceed the 200-day moving average by, let us say, 20%, then it would be time for the central bank to say, wait a minute, we're not issuing a new quote until we see that the 200-day moving average is, falls back to a more reasonable uh, distance from the price of silver. The price of silver and a 200-day moving average begin to, to follow each other instead of uh, following a, a trend which might lead to an excessive overvaluation. I think that would be a prudent thing to do, to avoid excessive overvaluation in case of a, a boom. And I wouldn't doubt that if any country in the world today were to announce that it's going to monetize silver, that would that would cause an enormous jump in the price of silver overnight because everybody would realize that if one country starts doing this, everybody else is going to do it at the same time. Now, what are the reasons? How much time do we have? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, good. Uh, I have some several reasons. Re reasons for, for introducing the silver dirham. The monetary history of the 20th century has been a history of increasing disorder and improvisation in the monetary affairs of the world. The disorder has come to a point where the world no longer uses real money in its transactions. It's bogus money, as Sheikh Imran has mentioned. Consequently, the mass of people in the world do not have a satisfactory and trustworthy means of creating personal savings. The silver coin converted into money would be an excellent medium for personal savings. 
Furthermore, we are witnessing the development of a worldwide problem, the inability of states to pay the pensions they promised to pay. It is therefore urgent for the population to exert itself to the utmost in providing personal savings for retirement. And saving the monetized silver coin would be the best means to do this. The, be the monetized silver coin could not be devalued. There are several reasons, in my view, that make the monetization of silver an attractive and feasible measure for Malaysia. One, the religious reason. This silver coin of three grams plus 0.27 grams of copper to provide hardness is a silver coin prescribed by Islamic Sharia law, unless I am mistaken. I hope I'm not in saying so. It is entirely fitting for a nation which incorporates such a large number of Muslims to have such a coin for their savings and for commerce. Because the coin, which would be about this size, you see, it would be a really small coin, could be used as money. For any emergency, it is immediately liquid. But people are not going to use it because they're going to use paper for all payments, because that is human nature. They are going to use paper for all payments and save the silver for their savings and for, for use when they are really are in an emergency. Now, some people might say, well, it's my religious duty to pay with a silver coin. Well, certainly they are, they are entirely free to do so and would be able to do so. However, I predict that most people will save these coins and not use them for payment. That's just my opinion. The social reason. An excellent way to assure the solidarity of the population with its government is for the government to carry out a measure most unusual in our times, to provide the population with a means of saving, which is also, also money, by creating a monetized silver coin, the dirham. A tranquil and confident population enjoying a means of savings which is reliable because it cannot be devalued is a necessary base for a stable government. This means of saving will exist in parallel with a Malaysian ringgit which leads, which tends to inflate away the savings of the Malaysian people especially affecting the most humble. I say this in spite of the fact that I note that over the last several months, the rate of exchange of the ringgit has been stable. Yes, it has been stable with regard to the dollar, but what is happening to the dollar? I mean, that is not a good, uh, that is not a good point of reference. We should refer the value of Silver and gold, that is well, the true measure of, of, uh, the, of stability. Now we have another reason, the center of gravity reason. As long as a Malaysian ringgit is inflating, a condition which must continue for an indefinite period ahead, there is a permanent temptation for Malaysian people to protect themselves from this inflation by acquiring foreign currencies, such as the euro or even the dollar. But if the Malaysian currency itself includes a monetized silver coin provided in abundance by the government and treasury, the center of gravity is retained in Malaysia itself. The urgent need for protection against inflation is readily available within the country. There is no need for the accumulation of foreign currencies as a hedge for a family or for a business. So that means the center of gravity is within your country and not outside, depending on somebody, some external currency. The political reason. This means that people, the people will feel proud to have this currency. And that acts as a cohesive effect of union amongst all the people because they are all dealing, they can deal with each other and and they're proud of having this currency and for special purposes they they can use it as money and they have a, they are proud of their savings and proud of their independence 
of themselves and of their country from on others because the, the silver coin gives you personal security, personal um, assurance of yourself. You don't have to rely on the, the money produced by a banking system of any part of the world. You have your own reserves. If some countries today are, their banks are asking for their gold to be returned, like Hugo Chavez in Venezuela is asking for, asked for his gold and he took it back to his country. Why shouldn't individuals have their reserves? Only governments? Only central banks? What about individuals? We're the ones that exist, you know. A, a, central, a central bank has no existence. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, then the economic reason. An economy built upon money which has no intrinsic value is an unstable economy, and we're seeing this. We're seeing this now, they want stimulus, and they're talking now of trillions, trillions of stimulus. But didn't they learn anything from Zimbabwe? Didn't they learn anything from what happened with Mr. Gono and his Zimbabwe dollars? I mean, we're doing exactly the same thing, and we're repeating the same mistakes of the French Revolution from 1790 to 1797 actually annihilated the French economy by printing up money and increasing amounts because the amount printed always was insufficient. First it may gave a good effect and then it, things returned to their previous uh, stagnation. So they printed more and the same effect in other words, stimulus, 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 until in the French Revolution, finally, everybody, in the, the common people were the ones that ended up with the stimulus money worth nothing, whereas the, the smarter people who had taken advantage had bought properties and objects and houses and things of value and given them and paid for them with papers because they knew where the thing was going to end. So this is totally unjust, a totally riba situation. So, so stability can only be built upon real money. The introduction of the monetary silver dirham is only the first step in the direction of stability, but the economy will begin to reap benefits immediately. The monetized silver dirham is a step toward reality as the basis for human interaction. The process of providing this real money to the population of Malaysia will take a generation as it is gradually placed in circulation in parallel with a fiduciary ringgit. Now, it could also, uh, uh, let's see, what, what is my current, uh, I want to mention that in Mexico, uh, we have a bank that goes by the name of Banco Azteca, which has established custody accounts that for, uh, for silver, for one single type of, sil of coin, a one ounce Libertad coin, Liberty, Liberty coin, one ounce pure silver coin. And and some people have taken advantage of this, not too many, but some people have taken advantage of this, of this uh, system of safekeeping their coins under the custody of the bank. But the, the, the person, st the individual still owns those coins. They are, they are only way being warehoused by the bank for the individual. Now, if the coin were monetized, those custody accounts would have a known monetary value and could provide the, an excellent collateral for loans which the owner might want to take out. Now, some, some are against this system, but others may not be against this system. I do not I do not, I'm not going to issue an opinion as a foreigner, and I'm not an Islamic. I defer to Sheikh Imran. Uh, 
but there are people who would find it useful to be able to to mobilize their silver coins and obtain ringgits for use in some business ende endeavor without having to sell their silver. They can still retain the property of the silver, but use it as collateral for loans in, in ringgit. And this would be a good thing for a banking system that is presently creating uh, loans out of nothing. Because here, as more and more people have custody accounts, and more and more people are using them as collateral, that elevates the quality of the bank because the bank is lending against, uh, against uh, deposits, previous deposits, not creating money out of thin air. It's using previous deposits as collateral. That is very healthy for the economy. That first comes savings, then comes credit. First, today all we read in the Straits Times is more credit, more credit. Everybody wants more credit. This is wrong. We have to start in the world, the whole world. First, save. That was always the elementary lesson of parents to their children. You must learn to save. You must learn to save. But, of course, if we're going to be, have to save papers which are worth nothing after a four or five years, well, how are you going to change how are you going to teach your children to save? This happened to, to my children. They saved their, their copper coins when they had some value, and then after, when they've grown up, they have, they have a, kilo, a kilo of copper coins. What good was the savings? I mean, only the idea of saving. So this is what I'm proposing. And do I have some time? Two minutes. Well. I will say goodbye. Uh, I, I leave you with, with my little opus here. I hope you find it of interest. And write me if you, if you, if you find that, uh, that, that the country has monetized the silver deer arm rule. Send me a letter, please. Thank you. Thank you. Here we go. Thank you very much. May I now call upon Dato Jamarul Khan to present a token of appreciation to both Mr. Salinas and Dr. Kevin Cox. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.